I'm thrilled to have this morning on this stage the greatest coach in the history of sports right here, John Wooden. You know, it's interesting if you think about, we uh, saw in the video last night, great coaching legends, legends like Vince Lombardi. Uh, there's legends like Adolph Rupp or Red Auerbach, legends like Coach uh, Casey Stingle. But Coach Wooden is acknowledged clearly as the greatest coach in sports history. And it's an acknowledgement for his achievements. Of course, he was a great player, but his achievements of, uh, as a coach are incomparable. But it's really more than about victories and championships. His acknowledgement as a great coach is because of character, the way he coached and the way he lived his life. And more significantly, as a master at unleashing the power of people, he impacted the lives of players for decades. They're still close to him. In fact, uh, you know that players like Bill Walton and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar still call coach almost every week today, decades after they played for him. Well, we're thrilled to be able to interview Coach Wooden today, but I think what's important is the application, his life lessons and his coaching lessons to our business and to our lives. I think the application this morning is gonna be clear. Coach was a master at unleashing the power of people. He led his teams with dedication, he led him to high levels of skill and execution, but it was really about sustained excellence that was his mark. And as we think about Chick-fil-A and the run we've been on over the last few years, you know, the challenge we have is how do we not just sustain excellence, but even accelerate the momentum and take it to the next level. So let's watch a little bit about the life and legacy and then welcome John Wooden. For John Wooden, a farm boy from Indiana, life was about hard work, discipline, and learning lessons. But it was also about basketball. Young Johnny Wooden played the sport shooting into a hoop his father forged out of iron. He would go on to become a star player for Martinsville High School and three-time All-American for Purdue University, earning a spot in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Some might say Wooden's greatest chance came in 1932, when he was offered the opportunity to play professionally for the Boston Celtics. But John Wooden was on a different path. He decided to become a teacher. After coaching high school and college basketball in Indiana, in 1948, he accepted the challenge to coach the weakest team in the Pacific Conference, the UCLA Bruins. Under his leadership and through years of persistence, he would transform the Bruins into the most accomplished college team in history with an undefeated 88-game winning streak, 10 NCAA championships in 12 years, and 885 victories with only 203 losses. Never before had any team achieved such victory and never before had any one coach been so successful. John Wooden was the first person in history to be inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame twice, first as a player and then as a coach. He was named coach of the 20th century by ESPN and awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest level of honor the president can bestow on an American. But for John Wooden, Success is not about medals or career wins. Success is about peace of mind, knowing you did your best to become the best that you are capable of becoming. As a coach, he never talked about winning and losing. Instead, he talked about character, being considerate of others, and personal preparation. Somehow, with all his victories and awards, John Wooden has never forgotten the life lessons he learned as a boy on the farm, and over the years has passed these lessons on to his players and other people preparing in life who have a chance to listen. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Coach John Wooden. Coach, we're obviously delighted and honored to have you here, but I understand that you uh, have now tasted the great taste of Chick-fil-A. Indeed, I have, and I enjoyed it immensely so much that uh, I tried it again. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that uh, you had a chance to have some of our folks from uh, California come out to see you this week and bring you some Chick-fil-A and visit with you, and they enjoyed their time with you. In fact, I see they've actually uh, changed your wardrobe a little bit there, Coach. Well, I hope you like it. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we like it a lot. It's a great tie. Thank you. Coach, uh, with all the accomplishments and uh, the affirmation, did you ever expect to be this famous? How do you keep it all in perspective? I don't consider myself famous at all. It's just the fact that I've been thrown into a position where I've been in the public eye a little more, purely and simply because I had the wonderful pleasure of having a lot of wonderful young men uh, under my supervision. If they hadn't have done well, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't be well there. But uh, I do appreciate and I, the light. Thank you very much for that very, very warm reception. Great. Now, I understand uh, there's a story about a statue in your hometown? Yeah. Yes, there's a statue, a life-size statue in the gymnasium in my hometown, which is named for me. And the trouble of it is when they delivered the statue, the head broke off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that was a sign or not, but anyway, <laughs> the sculptor, uh, they couldn't get in touch with him and they had another one do it and they sent a picture uh, to him and uh, he uh, put the, made the head of the picture. The problem is that it wasn't my picture that they sent. <laughs> uh, and uh, my children don't like it at all and I say, be quiet, it's better looking than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Now, Coach, you grew up in uh, rural uh, Indiana. Who was the greatest influence on you growing up? Well, my father, unquestionably. Uh, um, my father, to this day, I think is one of the finest uh, men you could possibly be. He never, he never had an unkind word to say about anyone. He never used a word profanity. He never complained about things. And he had reason to, I believe, on a number of occasions, but he just wouldn't do that. And, uh, Within my brothers, he had three rules. He said, uh, there should be time for play after the chores and the study is done. And he tried to impress that uh, on, on me and my brothers at all times. Now, did he offer any specific, uh, for example, I, I've read before about some rules that he offered to you or a creed to live by? Well, uh, first of all, it was two sets of threes he gave us. One was don't lie don't cheat, don't steal. And he said, if you don't lie, you won't have to remember what you said. And that's pretty good. <laughs> and the other one was, don't whine, don't complain, don't make excuses, just do the best you can. And uh, then when I graduated from a uh, small country grade school, he gave me a little card. And on one side was a verse by Reverend Henry Van Dyke that said, four things a man must learn to do if he would make his life more true. To think without confusion clearly, to love his fellow man sincerely, to act from honest motives purely, to trust in God and heaven securely. And on the other side with a seven point creed, and as I say all dad said was son, try to live up to these. The creed was the first one was be true to yourself. And certainly if you're true to yourself, you're gonna be true to all others. I'm, some of you may be familiar with some of Shakespeare's immortal plays where he, Polonius speaking to his son Laertes where he's leaving, going out in the world, and dad thinks he should give him some advice, knows he won't listen very much, but thinks he should give him some advice. And he said, neither a borrower nor lend a lender be, for a loan off loses itself in friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to anyone. The second one was help others. And I dare say that everyone in here 
today, if you just stop and think, your greatest joy comes when you've done something for somebody else. There's no greater joy than to learn that something you've said or done has been meaningful to another, especially when it was done with no thought of something in return. And then was drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible. And then was make friendship a fine art. Don't, don't, you must work at making friends. You must work at making friendship flourish. Don't take it for granted. And then the one that probably I used a little more toward the development of my idea of teaching uh, sports was make each day your masterpiece. Just do your best you can every day. No one can do more than that. They may have more ability, maybe more facilities and other things, but no one can do more than making the effort to do the best of which they can. Then the next one was build a shelter against a rainy day. And he wasn't thinking of an earthly shelter. I think of when I think of, uh, uh, of that, I think when Socrates was unjustly uh, imprisoned, facing imminent death, he, he still faced it with serenity. And the jailers couldn't understand that. And they said, why aren't you preparing for death? And he said, I've been preparing for death all my life, but the life I've led. And that's what I believe Dad meant. And the last one was <clears throat> never forget to give thanks for your blessings and pray for guidance every day. That was the seven-point creed. People ask me if I've lived up to it. And I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I've tried, and I think that's all I, uh, Dad would expect it. That's all I expected of young people under my supervision, of my children, grandchildren. Uh, and my 13 great-grandchildren, all I ask is try. Now, growing up, uh, you met your wife, Nellie. How, tell us about that. <laughs> well, Nellie's the only girl I ever went with. And uh, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I lived on the farm eight miles away from this little town. And uh, I had seen her, and I thought she was kind of cute, but <laughs> she didn't see me for anything. And, uh, <laughs> but that summer, I was... Uh, I was in uh, plowing corn, actually, uh, and I was resting the team and turned the corner, and there's someone drove up on a dirt road right close by, and this little girl hopped out, and then her dearest friend and her dearest friend's um, brother had a car, and they'd driven up the eight miles, and they got out and motioned for me to come over, and I wouldn't go, and I wouldn't go, and finally they drove away, and, and next uh, year, my first class in High school, I was headed to algebra class, and here she was. With the thought, Why didn't you come over and see us? And I said, well, I was perspiring, and I was dirty, and you had to make fun of me. And she said, <clears throat> and I can see her to this day. She said, I would never make fun of you. Mm. That started it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Coach, how did you get into coaching? Tell us about your, your first job. Well, I went to Purdue University with the hopes of becoming a civil engineer. And had there been uh, Purdue's a great engineering school, mm -hmm. and had there been athletic scholarships, <clears throat> or if my parents had had any uh, financial means to help, that's what I would have ended up. But, uh, but I didn't know uh, high school counseling wasn't that good, and I didn't know that to get my degree in civil engineering, I would have to go to a, a civil camp every summer, and I was going to have to work in the summer, so I couldn't do that. So at the end of my freshman year, when I found this out, I changed to a liberal arts course and knew that I was going to teach and just assumed I majored in English tonight, but I assumed I'd be teaching sports too. Mm. Now, how did you end up at UCLA? Well, it's sort of interesting. I was very happy uh, uh, teaching school at a high school in South Bend, Indiana. But um, I enlisted in the service in World War II in 1942, and when I was discharged in 1946 and came back, things had changed a little bit and I didn't like the way they were treating some of the returning servicemen, although I had no complaints about myself. But I decided I didn't want to work for them anymore. And while I was debating on a couple of other high schools and I offered me the opportunity, the president of Indiana State University called me and asked me to come there and replace the man who had been my high school coach. Mm. And so I went to Indiana State as the athletic director and head basketball and baseball coach. And uh, I was there two years, and we did pretty well. And I had some opportunities at other schools. And I wanted to stay in the Big Ten. And I was uh, been offered the Minnesota job and the UCLA job. And it got to the point where UCLA wanted a final, final decision. 
and uh, Minnesota. Uh, they were, had to find a, a position for the man I was replacing. And they would have called me at a certain time, and they didn't. And uh, UCLA called me, and I gave, I committed myself. And about an hour later, Minnesota called and said, everything's OK. And I said, yeah, it's too late. I've just committed myself, and I go back on my word. And then I found out that they said it was an unseasonable snowstorm. They couldn't get to the line, or they would have called me. So that's how close I had come to staying in the Big Ten. Well, UCLA, the better for it. Coach, when you went to UCLA, mm -hmm. obviously you created a winner there. But for years, you won conference championships, but it was a long time before you won the national championship. Uh, a couple of questions here. One, how did you stay motivated and also motivate your players not winning the big one? And did you change anything to actually shift from being a, a strong uh, leader in the conference versus winning the national championship? Well, I think I changed. I think I learned more. I hope I was continuing to learn each and every year. Even after that, I hope I was continuing to learn even my last year of teaching. But um, um, most of all, I think it was, uh, un, un, I didn't know I was doing it, but I was bemoaning some of the things we did not have. I had to practice on the third floor of an old gym, climb three flights of stairs, uh, wrestling was practicing at the end, gymnastics on this side, and my players told me actually that occasionally on the other side was two trampolines. And my players told me that quite frequently co-eds were hopping up and down on that, uh, sort of scantily clad <laughs> costume. My players told me this. I didn't notice it at all myself. <laughs> but, uh, but I would sweep and mop that floor. I did that for 17 years. But I, 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 I was concerned. I, I got concerned over things over which I had no control. And my dad had tried to teach that uh, if you get too involved and concerned in regard to things over which you have no control, it's going to have an adverse effect on things which you have control. Our entrance requirements were much higher than other teams in our conference, and some players that wanted to come to UCLA very much couldn't get in, and they'd go to other places. And I, got, I let that bother me. And in that, I'm sure that I was not treating the ones I had uh, as well as I should have. I didn't, I, I was cheating them in a sense. And, but I finally think I overcome that, and uh, we won our first two national championships under those conditions, and then that brought about the erection of Poly Pavilion, uh, uh, at that time the best college uh, place on the coast, and we did extremely well from that time on. You did 10 national championships, seven in a row. Once you started winning those championships, uh, how did you maintain your commitment to excellence without at all getting complacent? Well, I've always tried to teach that today is the only day over which you have control. What happened yesterday will not uh, have any uh, control over what happens today, except learn from it. You'll never know a thing you didn't learn from someone in the past. And yesterday you learned from the past, but it's not going to affect what you do today. Tomorrow will be affected by what you do today. Today is the only, only day that amounts to anything. And I tried to use that philosophy with my players to try to just become a little better each day. I, I love poetry, and uh, many of my players know that. Many write me poems. One has written me over 100 poems, and he's he pretty good. And he wrote one, and kind of, he's, he's written a poem on almost every maxim I've used, and, and all the blocks in my pyramid and all that. But one he wrote, entitled today, one, one verse in his verse, he says, Coach, you're a hunter and a seeker, not for silver or for gold, not for treasure or for pleasure or for anything that's sold. You're a connoisseur of living as you move along life's way with no worries of tomorrow, for you have found today. That's what I tried to teach. Today is the only day you can do anything about it. And uh, you can't just say it. You've got to do it, and you've got to repeat it. Repetition is one of the laws of learning, and it must be used over and over. Now, you recruited great players at UCLA. And in our business, selecting for talent is critically important. What did you look for in a potential player? From a physical point of view, I look for quickness. Quickness under control. It must be under control. Now, uh, I wanted my players to be tall, of course, but I would give up some size to get more quickness. I didn't expect uh, uh, my centers to be quicker than the forwards or the guards, but I hope that 
my forwards would be quicker than other forwards, my uh, guards quicker than other guards, and my center quicker than other center. Now, I didn't expect all five of them to be quicker, but I, I felt if we could get an advantage of at least three, we'd have a little bit of advantage. So I'm looking for quickness. That's from a physical point of view. Then uh, equally important, I wanted the type of players I knew that would be considered of others and would be team players. I wanted to definitely be team players. And from that, I wanted to study their transcripts. I wanted to know what their faith was. I wanted to know whether they were a single uh, uh, child or whether they had uh, siblings. I wanted to know what their parents did. I wanted to know um, what their uh, uh, extra curricular activities was and all those things and I'd get a pretty good mind on what a youngster was uh, uh, from that once I found out of course whether if he's going to have the grades to get in. Did you consider character at all in your selection? Oh absolutely. Uh, character is so important in everything uh, and character uh, is what you really are. It, that, you're the only one that knows your character. You don't know my character. I know my character. You know my reputation. It could be different. Repetition is what you're perceived to be by others. Your character is what you really are. And certainly on all these things that I would study on the transcript, I'm, I'm determining the character of the individual. And that'll determine to some extent, too, whether or not he'll be a good team player or he'll be a, a selfish player thinking too much of himself. You know, as we think about your teams at UCLA as well as the other places you've coached, uh, many would say, of course, you've been very successful but you have a little bit different definition of success than I think others do. Can you tell us about that? Well, I go back to my dad and uh, uh, trying to coin my own definition of success, which I did in 1934. I was unhappy with the way many parents judged the success of their youngster or the teacher in my English classes. If they didn't make an A or a B, some parents would make the youngster or the teacher feel that they had failed, and I didn't like that. And I noticed most parents, if the, if the <coughs> neighbor's children got a C, the average grade, that was all right, because neighbor's children are all very average. But for their own, no, they didn't like that. I didn't <laughs> like that way of judging, and uh, I wanted to come up with something, a definition of my own. And there are two or three things entered into it. My father in teaching, as I'm on one of them, never tried to be better than someone else, never tried to be better than someone else. You have no control over that but never cease trying to be the best you can be and learn from others. And um, then I ran across a very simple verse that said, at God's footstool to confess, a poor soul knelt and bowed his head. I failed, he cried. The master said, thou didst thy best. That is success. And I believe that is true. And then I recalled a class discussion of success, which I'd been in a number of years before. And from those, I coined my own definition of success Success is peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable, and you're the only one that will know that. I have a book for children out with another fellow called Inch and Miles. Now, for children, I define success a little differently. I define it as happiness in your heart in knowing you tried your best. Now, my daughter, who's over 70, said, Dad, I understand that a little better now. I never did understand that peace of mind business, but <laughs> happiness in your heart, I do. So how did that actually impact the way you communicated to your players about winning and about the competition? Did you talk about winning a lot? I don't think you can find any players that tell me you heard me, ever heard me mention winning. I want winning to be the byproduct of the preparation, and failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And I wanted them to always have that satisfaction within themselves, that peace of mind within themselves, to know that they'd made the effort to execute near their own particular level of competency. Not trying to be better than someone else, but trying to be the best that you could be. One of my players who was a very interesting person, some of you I'm sure have heard of, Bill Walton. He once said that um, we had to send a manager, uh, when we're dressing for a game, we had to send a manager up to get a program to find out who we're playing because I never mentioned the opposition, <laughs> which is a little different. <laughs> I wanted the emphasis placed on the improvement of ourselves and trying to cover the other things as much as uh, possible. Well, let's talk a little more specifically about the way you taught your players at UCLA. Now, at the beginning of the year, <laughs> you had some routines that uh, you helped them understand the importance of fundamentals. 
they laugh about that. And one of them has a poem now that I still put my socks on this very same way. Uh, first thing, when I talked to them early <clears throat> meeting a couple of weeks before practice would start, I'd call them together again and stress again why they're there to, for academic reasons. That must be number one. But I'd, I'd stress other things about politeness and courtesy and how many treat everybody else and so on. And, and then I'd say, now, young man, I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to show you how to put on your shoes and socks. <laughs> oh, this, okay, here it comes again. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but I'd found out many years before um, that blisters, uh, uh, your feet surely come around the little toe area and the heel area. And they're usually caused by <coughs> wrinkles <coughs> in the socks or shoes that don't fit properly. So I showed them <laughs> how to put on their socks. I'd take my, you know, put them, get so there'd be no wrinkles around the little toe and pull it up and then tell them how to open the shoe and lace it tightly. And I found out that most players had <coughs> wore shoes that were maybe a size or at least a half size larger than they should. I didn't want any slipping because basketball is a quick stops and starts, change direction, change. I didn't want any slipping. That will call, cause uh, blisters. Now, the reason that children um, wear, uh, they're accustomed to wearing a sh a shoes a little too long, and I suspect many of your parents will find this true, you buy shoes for your children a thumbnail too long. They never get to wear shoes that fit. <laughs> their, 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 their shoes are worn out before their foot grows into it. So you get some new shoes, half a million a fingernail too long. And so I think that's the reason. So I put, the, I wanted the, the, the toes right at the end where there, there'd be no, no slippage. So the focus on the mental, fundamental right. started right at the beginning of the year. Now, you had clear standards for things like haircuts and facial hair and uniforms. Mm -hmm. Even in the 60s, when it seemed like all standards were challenged, were those standards ever challenged by your players? Of course. <clears throat> the one I mentioned, Bill Walton. <laughs> <laughs> After um, he, um, his sophomore year, uh, he, we had had an undefeated national championship, and he was selected player of the year. And from that last game until October the 14th, when we have uh, picture day, you can't practice according to the laws or the rules at that particular time, he hadn't shaved or got a haircut. And he came in picture day to get his game uniform where they'd take team pictures and so on and, and uh, interviews to get them out of the way because the practice is going to start the next day. And he said, you don't have a right to tell me how to wear my hair. And I said, you're right, Bill. I don't have that right. However, I do have the right to determine who's going to play. We're going to miss you. <laughs> <laughs> He's... <clears throat> He's been asked a number of times, do you think Coach would have backed that up? And he said, well, I got fixed up in a hurry, didn't I? <laughs> but Bill Walton is a wonderful person. He tested you a little bit. Children will test you. And ball players were my children in a way, extended family. They don't get upset when they test you. Don't give in to them or who, they got you. And you start giving in to them. Don't give in to them, but stand up for the things you're right. I didn't like excessive but long hair or extra hair because I said, it causes extra perspiration. That perspiration comes down. It can get in your eyes, on your hands. It can cause uh, you to make errors in your play. And furthermore, we practice usually uh, concludes in the early evening. Um, and uh, it's a little damp to go outside. And it's more difficult to get your hair completely dry when you go outside. And it makes you more susceptible to colds and uh, more more work time is lost in the country on other things through the common cold than anything else. So um, you, you won't dry, it's easier to get dry it if you, uh, it's not too long. And uh, I don't think they bought it, but those are the reasons that I gave them. <laughs> Coach, you're so specific with your attention to detail and instructions. Uh, I'm fascinated from a basketball standpoint, uh, when your teams would run the fast break, mm -hmm. you were very specific of where the players would run in terms of their lanes and the, the places you wanted them to shoot the basketball. Yes. Why were you so specific about those kinds of instructions? Well, I think there's some areas where they're going to be better and that you've got to learn balance. Balance next to love is the most important word in our language. And we must have balance on the fast break and it, as just as we have on our set offense or our half court defense. And um, I wanted to know that um, we, we, if we do properly, uh, we are going to get the ball through the middle He's going to stop up the foul line. We have one wingman. 
a little ahead of him and one right behind. We do we do it one both at the same time. This is not open, maybe this one will go open. Then we have a trailer coming that can go either side, and then we have a protector after that. So we have to repeat and repeat that in, uh, in our practices every day, but teaching each one, depending on the position they're in, where you start to break from the defensive end, which place you go. If a man's ahead of you, in front of you, one, you've got to take a different place, and so on. So it, it just takes, uh, you have to teach, you have to teach. Uh, also to that point, uh, my understanding when we visited with you in California that some of it was related to the percentages that improved based on the shooting but oh, yeah. also the rebounding. Oh yes, I, uh, I probably worked on the, on the board shot more than anybody else off the board uh, and uh, I, I found out through a study with a, with a friend of mine who was my assistant when I taught in high school in South Bend who was a mathematician and a wonderful person and we worked out something and we found that there's a certain angle that if you took the shot from there, your percentage was slightly higher, plus you had a better idea of the rebounding. Our offensive rebounding, if we missed, it was, in, was improved. So, but we had to work that out, and so we're gonna get practice. You know, if you're coming down the side, if you're in this area, use the board. If you're a little far, you don't use the board. But I want you to get to that area where you use the board. That's right. And uh, so it worked out. It just, just, we, we felt we proved it to our own satisfaction that in certain areas, uh, you would improve the results. Now, in our business, the sense of urgency is very important. You've got a customer at the counter, at the drive through window, in a food court, uh, sense of urgency really matters. You have this phrase that you use often, be quick, but don't hurry. What, what is, what's the essence of that? Well, at times, if we start hurrying, we make mistakes. We're mm -hmm. more apt to make mistakes. But on the other hand, if you're not quick, you may be too late and you might not get it done. For example, <clears throat> I had some players that were very quick. Ooh, boy, they're quick. They could get all sorts of shots, but they couldn't shoot. That didn't help us. <laughs> <laughs> then I had some others, that great shooters. Ooh, boy. But they were quick, couldn't get any shots. They didn't help us either. So uh, you've got to uh, figure out where you're, you have to be quick. You have to know what to do, but you have to be quick to do it, or you might not get to do it at all. And um, I, I think that's very important. I think that's, that's important in most everything. Don't, don't hurry. You, you make mistakes when you hurry. Be under control. I want quickness under control. Quickness under control. Uh, yeah, otherwise, you'll have activity without achievement. And I don't care for activity without achievement. I want something <laughs> too. Your coaching style, very different from many coaches today. Coaches today walk up and down the sideline. They're constantly shouting instructions to the players during the game. And you sat on the bench and were, often were quiet during the game. Well, uh, good Lord and his infinite wisdom treated us all differently, you know. Mm. And because one does something doesn't mean they're wrong and you're right or vice versa. But I felt that, uh, that to my players would have more... Um, be more under control if I seem to be under control. If I get out of control, how can I tell them to be under control? How can I tell them that if they lose their self-control, they're going to be outplayed when I apparently am losing my self-control on the bench? So I tried to do that uh, part of the example. The example is uh, the greatest teaching thing we have. Uh, I once heard something said, uh, no written word, no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves it's what the teachers are themselves. Well, a coach, that's all he is, is a teacher. And I think your actions can determine to a great deal the actions of those under your uh, supervision. So uh, I, I tried, I tried to, uh, not to get too involved. Yeah, you're going to get excited, you know. Mm -hmm. But I taught 40 years, and I had two technicals, and one I didn't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, 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 didn't, <clears throat> I didn't mention the fact that there might have been many times I would have deserved one and didn't get it, but <laughs> we'll forget those. <clears throat> uh, Coach, uh, earlier you mentioned about competition and even to the point of uh, not knowing perhaps who you were really playing in the next game, but you seem to have been aware of competition. Did you try to learn from competition? Oh, that's, that's where we learn, absolutely. We must... Uh, uh, understand uh, the, the competition against is what's making them successful and uh, uh, learn from it. That's, that's, 
we don't know a thing. We don't learn from somebody else, and uh, we want to learn from those that we think are executing better at whatever they're doing and study them. They must always keep studying. I, uh, I, I took a project every summer after basketball season was over. A couple of weeks later, I would start researching a project. I might take one year in the jump shot. I might take free throw shooting. I might take uh, act acting the zone or zone. And I would contact all the coaches that I knew that I thought excelled in that particular aspect and some of the players. And um, uh, I, I would call them and, and ask them to fill out questionnaires. And then I'd make one composite of all this that I would get from all this. And I thought that would help me uh, you know, improve my own uh, feeling about things, and uh, uh, I, I think it did. Now, did you ever share your findings on your free throws or rebounding or jump shooting best there, practices? There are no secrets, in my opinion. It's just the ability to execute uh, properly and quickly. And, and yes, yeah, so when I spoke at clinics, I never, I never held anything back. I, I had, uh, I don't think there's any, any secrets. It's just in the execution. And how important is preparation to execution? Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. You must be prepared to take a test, uh, to, to uh, or do anything. You must, you must, must be prepared. <laughs> you, you can't bake a cake without getting the ingredients <laughs> beforehand and be prepared with them all. And that would be true in almost every area of our lives. Now, what happened if a player didn't respond? Someone who perhaps was not playing at their highest level. Well, uh, I had the greatest ally in the world, the bench. <laughs> <laughs> they could sit by me a while, and I might talk to them a moment and uh, might give them a chance to, to, to try again. And uh, if they tried again and didn't uh, shape up, I, they'd be sitting back on the bench again. It's, it's the greatest, greatest ally you have. But remember, one of the greatest motivating things in the world is the pat on the back. Every one of you, you like to be pat on the back. If you say you don't, you're lying. <laughs> Everyone likes to be pat on the back. And, uh, uh, but sometimes the pat has to be a little lower and a little harder. But, uh, <laughs> But I think uh, any person in the position of leadership uh, must get it across to the, uh, those under your supervision, whether it be uh, in business or in uh, uh, sports or whatever it might be, that you care for them. You care for them as a person. You care for them. You care about their family. You care for them. I wanted to know if my players, parents were having any problems or uh, brothers or sisters. I want to know those things. One of the problems that they might be having that maybe just talking over problems can help maybe you can't solve them but you can help and uh, it's, it's just very important uh, so important that you know that you get across to them that you care for them individually did you ever have players actually break the rules deliberately how did you handle them did you treat them all the same they were denied the privilege of practicing and if they not if they don't practice that means they're not going to play so much of their playing time will be cut I had three rules that I used pretty much through the, all the time. On time, I was a stickler for time. They had to be on time for everything, uh, to class, to practice, to the table, uh, everything, time. I insisted they be on time. Maybe I went too strong at times. Uh, but if they, for example, they didn't show up practice time, they didn't get to practice. And uh, then another rule I had was uh, not one word of profanity. I would not permit one word of profanity. You live it, practice, you're out of here for the day. And don't, hurt, don't hold it against you, I'm gonna, but you're out for the day, and that's gonna cost you some playing time. You know, if it's having it a game, you're gonna come out of the game, you're gonna sit. I don't say you're gonna sit for the rest of the game, but you're gonna sit. And then the third rule I had, you never criticize a teammate. Never criticize a teammate. I say, that's my job. I was paid to do it. Not yours, I paid pitifully poor in those days, but. <laughs> <laughs> Not like they are today, where the coaches today will make more in one year than I made in 40 years, but mm. that's all right. I could use to get, I, one time I could buy six hamburgers for a quarter, two. <laughs> <laughs> I could get gas for 12, 15 cents a gallon. The things have changed. Do you see yourself, and did you see yourself, more as a coach or a teacher? Oh, a teacher, by all means. I'm a teacher. That's all a coach is, your teacher. You're teaching the sport, whatever sport that might be. 
but you're a teacher and you have to seem to follow the same laws of learning and I had to follow in teaching my uh, youngsters to parse a sentence or write a, or a composition or, or uh, um, doing something else in the English class. Now, earlier you mentioned these two words, love and balance. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about why you think those are the two most important words. Well, if you come in my little condo that I have that, uh, that uh, well, it's not, it's a small condo, but one bookcase is carved in the style of love and the other is balance and another one is, uh, is uh, drink, uh, drink deeply from good books, especially the Bible. Then, love is obviously the most important word in our language. We had it throughout this troubled world to the extent that I think we would have love for one another. Our problems would not be as severe. We'd have problems, of course, but they would not be unmanageable if we just had more love and consideration for the other side, whatever it might be. Now, we must keep things in perspective. Balance is keeping things in perspective. Don't get carried away if things are going too well or things are going too poorly. Don't get carried away. Just continue making the effort to do the best you can at whatever you're doing. And you must always be learning, learning from others, to improve yourself in the activities in which you're involved, whatever they might be. And I think that, uh, so I, I, I really believe that uh, those are, are uh, all words are important, of course, but I believe that they are probably the two most important words to me, at le least. Uh, I think they are. The phrase that I've read you used many, many times, your personal best. What is the significance of that? You can't have peace with yourself unless you know that you've made the effort to execute near your own particular level of competency, whatever that might be. That is your personal best when you know that you have made that effort. You'll have peace with yourself. And you, when you have peace with yourself, you're going to be able to do all things uh, much better, whatever it might be, whether it be personal things, whether it be your rapport with other people or whatever it might be. But you must have uh, peace with yourself to do that. Uh, some people ask me, I'm quite frequently now at 96 years of age, going on 97, what do you attribute to the fact that you live so long? I say, well, I've never used alcohol. Does that have anything to do with it? It didn't seem to bother uh, George Burns, who lived over 100, and he had a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Winston Churchill <laughs> enjoyed it, and so on. And, 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 um, but I said, I think I have peace with myself, peace with myself. And I'm not afraid of uh, what's going to come in the future. I'm not, I'm not afraid of peace with myself. You have peace with yourself, then you're not going to let things get to you too much. You, you'll be able to execute near your level of competency. Now, seven straight national championships, yes. 88 straight victories, 10 national championships overall. Is there one key to sustaining that level of excellence over that period of time? Well, you mustn't get <coughs> carried away uh, with it. You, you got to. Uh, work at the present to help the past, uh, to help the future. You can't, uh, you can't rely, on, rely on it just because it happened in the past. Uh, but to be quite honest, the better you do, the easier things are. The more talent you'll <clears throat> draw, whether it be, in my opinion, whether it be in business or in sports, whatever it is. Uh, Recruiting at UCLA when we started winning the national championship, more players wanted to come. Mm. And uh, uh, I think success breeds success. And uh, I think it's that uh, more than anything else. Uh, I, I differ with some of the ideas. Uh, like some have said, uh, they'd rather be an underdog than to be the favorite. Not me. <laughs> I'd rather be the favorite. I'd absolutely rather be the favorite. Uh, you know, if, if, if somebody uh, knocks me down, uh, or, or I knock somebody down. Now, which one would I want to go up against? The one I knocked down. I don't want to knock that much at me. No, no. I, I'd rather be the favorite at all times. Mm. Looking back over your life, what's the greatest challenge you've ever faced? Losing my Nelly. 
That's the greatest challenge. When I didn't care much to whether I carried on or not at that particular time, but with my great grandchildren coming along at that time, she didn't live to see any of my 13, our 13. And uh, I think then get myself and the feet on the ground and, uh, and carrying on. And uh, um, I think that is, of course, a challenge in, in uh, of getting yourself under control. That was the biggest thing I've had. Your greatest joy? in life? What? Your greatest joy in life? My great-grandchildren, my grandchildren, <laughs> and my, my family. That, that, their greatest, greatest joy, yeah. That, that, yes, they're my greatest. And how did you balance family with such a demanding coaching career? Well, I think uh, there's three things that I've used, and I speak about these in the book. There's faith, family, and friends. If you have, uh, if you have those three, what else do you need? Faith, family, and friends. If you have faith, you're going to be at ease. You have your family around you. That you can have much else. And friends, we need friends. And uh, we have those. We have all we need. And what role did faith play in your life? An immense role. You have to believe. At the top of my pyramid of success, on one side, from the last block, competitive greatness, leading up to the apex on which success rests, according to my definition. On one side, I have patience, and the other side, I have faith. You must have patience. You, good things take time, and that's the way it should be. We don't want it to be, but it, uh, that's the way it should be, and we should e expect that. Have patience. And then the other is faith. We must believe. We must believe. We must have faith that things are going to turn out as they should. That they wouldn't always be the way we would want them to. But as long as we do what we're capable of doing to help things uh, turn out the way we want them to, uh, we have to believe that, uh, have to have faith that things uh, will be okay in the end. We don't have to, it's not in the eyes of others, but in, in our own. Now, I know you have a favorite poem about faith, about a little fellow who follows you. Yes. When, uh, when my son was born in 1936, I had just finished doing a, or editing a book for Harcourt Racing Company, and I'd finished that, and they sent me, of course, the check. <laughs> and they sent me a set of encyclopedias. I'll bet they were that many. And if you had put that along Book of Knowledge to, today, you'd say, well, I guess they didn't, not, not much happen before 1936, but <laughs> I guess it did. But they sent me a picture of a man walking along the seashore, and his little son is trying to step in the footprints behind him before the wind whisks him away. And there are some lines along the side that say, a careful man I must always be, a little fellow follows me. I know I dare not go astray, for fear he'll go the self same way. I cannot once escape his eyes. Whate'er he sees me do, he tries. Like me, he says, he's going to be this little chap who follows me. He thinks that I am good and fine, believes in every word of mine. The base in me, he must not see, this little chap who follows me. I must be careful as I go through summer's sun and winter's snow because I am building for the years to be this little chap who follows me. And that's what we're all doing, not necessarily our own flesh and blood, but others who observe us. We're setting examples uh, for others. And, and our conduct will have a great bearing on our youth, certainly. And our youth is our future. Now, as you taught, one of the things that you used to teach was your pyramid of success. Correct. How did you develop it, and what role did that play in your teaching? Well, I think it helped. I, I didn't like that the way of judging success, you know, whether an A or B or scoring more points or something. I think you can be successful without that. And I, I wanted to come up to somebody who would help me and become a better teacher, and, and I coined the, my definition for success. And then I, that then wouldn't be working very well. And, uh, uh, I tried to analyze it in why, and I decided to come up with somebody you could see. A definition is something other abject. If I could come up with somebody you could see, and here again, from the hidden recesses of the mind, I recalled something that I'd seen many years before called a ladder of achievement. Someone had taken a ladder, five rungs on the ladder, 
and they named each rung of the ladder some particular trait or characteristic that this individual felt was necessary to get to the top of the ladder where we'd all like to get. We might differ on what we consider the top of the ladder to be, but we'd like to get there, whatever we consider it to be. So I couldn't use a ladder, but it gave me an idea of a pyramid, and I started working on this. All I had to begin was at the apex, success, I didn't know how many blocks, but the first two blocks I chose were the cornerstones. If any structures to have any real strength, solidity, it must have a strong foundation, and of course the cornerstones anchor the foundation. And in anything, the two cornerstones I think are so important. One is industriousness, hard work. There's no substitute. You're looking for the easy way, the trick, the shortcut. You'll not be developing your talents. There's no substitute for hard work. And the other is enthusiasm. You have to enjoy what you're doing. If you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're not going to be able to, to work as hard as you're capable of doing. In the foundation between the cornerstones, I had three blocks that include others. Friendship, loyalty, and cooperation. Now, I could talk a lot on all three of those, but I won't. I'll just go up and give you an idea. The second tier, I chose four blocks. Self-control, alertness, initiative, and intentness. You must maintain self-control. Those of you who are going to play golf while you're here, you better maintain self-control or the ball will either be farther to the right or left than it normally is for most of you. <laughs> you must be alert and alive and always learning. Abraham Lincoln, my favorite American, said, he never met a person from whom he did not learn something, although most of the time it was something not to do. That's learning. You must be <laughs> alert and alive. You must have initiative. Don't be afraid to fail. We're all imperfect. We're going to fail on occasions. Learn from our failures and not repeat them. And then intentness. I might, I might say determination. I might have said persistence. I might have said perseverance. Be intent on reaching realistic objectives and know that there's going to be obstacles along the way. But don't, make, don't let them make you quit. Someone said, when I look back, it seems to me all the grief that had to be left me when the pain was over stronger than I was before. We got stronger through adversity. And then above those, I had three blocks, condition, skill, and team spirit. You must be conditioned for whatever you're doing. There's different types of conditioning. You don't have to be conditioned in the way that a football linebacker has to be. A surgeon that might be different from an attorney. You must be conditioned for whatever you're doing. And then you must have the skills. You must be able to execute, not only properly, quickly. And you must have consideration for others, team spirit. It's an eagerness. Team spirit is an eagerness to lose oneself in the group for the welfare of the group. We need that. We need that so much. If we had more of that throughout this troubled world, our problems would not be as severe. Then we move up to poise and confidence. You must believe in yourself, but you can't if you're not prepared. And poise is just being yourself, is my definition for poise. Just being yourself. If you're yourself, you won't be pretending, you won't acting, you'll not be something you're not, you'll execute near your level of competence. All these things will make you competitive. Competitive greatness, the last block, and then from the one side leading up is patience, the other side is faith, up to the apex. And so it's a gradual process. I worked on it for 14 years before I brought it to its present form. I could change the names of some of them, but I, I haven't seen fit to to make a change in it since I completed it in 1948. And you shared that philosophy with each team each year? Yes, I did. I spoke to them one time, and then I would ask any of them, if they want to talk to me about certain things to come in and talk to me about it, but I didn't berate it at all. And I would say that many, many of my players have said that, uh, that well, I'll give you an example. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who, uh, I always think of as Louis Alcindor. When, and uh, he had, somebody asked him, what do you think of Wooden's Pyramid? He said, I thought it was one of the corniest things I'd ever seen when I first saw it. Before I got out of school, I found out that it was kind of important. But it wasn't until after I was out of college for a few years that I found out how truly important it was. So they don't get it immediately, but if it can help you sometime for the future, I think it helped me become a better teacher, and if it can help somebody else do better in whatever they're doing, that's good. That pleases me. 
would have had such an impact on so many teams. As you look back over your career as a coach, which of your teams was the greatest team that you coached? You have children? Two. <laughs> which is the greatest? No, I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't say that any are, are the greatest. I could point out certain things. I would say if we would never went to the, uh, the champions of the national championship teams, I would say three different ones probably gave me a little more uh, enjoyment. One would be the very first one, because it's like your first child, you, your first one, and you want one, and, and we were undefeated, and it was the shortest team to ever win the national championship, didn't lose a game. And, we weren't picked to be among the top 40 or 50 teams before the season started. And then, and then we had an exciting pressing defense and the players played together about as well as it's possible. So obviously that was one that gave me great satisfaction. And then the last one, obviously, I had announced my retirement two days before and you'd kind of like to go out with a winner and there again, the, that year, we were not expected to do that well. We were going to have a good team, but didn't expect, uh, we weren't expected to win a championship because from the preceding year, I had lost by graduation two superstars in Bill Walton and Keith Wilkes, and I lost, also lost our starting guards, Greg Lee and Tommy Curtis, and so we're starting with only one returning starter, and, and we came back, won the championship, and have, we'd like to go out I received uh, shortly after that a letter, handwritten letter from the White House from a fellow by the name of President Richard Nixon. And he was just leaving on a little different circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> and this letter that I received, handwritten, not dictated, handwritten, um, congratulating me. And uh, it's a rather poignant, if you know the circumstances about it, it's rather poignant. And my late wife wanted to have it. Uh, uh, framed and put up, but she had it as, as a big for him. So that gave me pleasure. And then I had another team of the championship teams now, I'm saying, and that was the year I called it the team without. That's the team without Al Cinder. Mm -hmm. Al Cinder just graduated, and a lot of coaches and some of the media said, wait till the big guy's gone. They're going to get their comeuppance. Mm -hmm. And we did, because the next four years we won the national championships. <laughs> <laughs> But it's always more gratifying, perhaps, to do the unexpected than it is the expected. And yet I had teams that didn't win national championships that I felt, in my mind, were just as successful as some that went undefeated. Now, the alumni wouldn't agree with me on that, but it's what I feel is the more important. Now, Coach, over the years, my understanding is, as you were at games, you always carried some special things in your pocket. <laughs> you want to tell us about those? Well, in 1942, when I went and enlisted to go in the service at the uh, World War II, my minister, I have it somewhere, my minister gave me a little cross. And um, I always carried this little cross in my pocket, in my hand, in any times where I thought there would be any stress. I think that, um, that officials probably appreciated the fact that I did that. I can't find it, but it's in my pocket somewhere. If I've lost that, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> <laughs> I've been carrying it since 1942. <laughs> well, there's a little pocket knife, and there's a Mother Teresa, and there's a Mahatma Gandhi coin, <laughs> and there's an Abraham Lincoln coin, and there's another one on Mother Teresa. But I don't find the cross yet. Come, please, 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 please. Ah. Since 1942, when I enlisted in the service, my minister gave me this, and I, I've carried it in my hand at games. Nobody knew it. I never, never wanted anybody to know. My players didn't know it. They'd be there. They knew I carried a rolled up program, but they didn't know I had this. And in times of stress, I feel that just having it in the pocket is 
gives you a sense of serenity, which is, uh, is uh, very good. It's an unusual cross. They're sort of worn off. You can hardly see it. But on one side is the, uh, is the alpha and omega, the, the, the beginning and the end. And then is the heart and the monad, uh, very special things. But uh, through the years, that's kind of you can hardly see. They're still there to some extent. And we'll put it back before we lose it. <laughs> you know, Coach, 96 years old. As you think about the road behind and the road ahead, any thoughts? <laughs> well, um, um, he, sometimes I think the faiths must grin as we denounce them and insist the only reason we can't win is the fates themselves have missed. Yet there lives on the ancient claim, we win or lose within ourselves. The shining trophies on our shelves can never win tomorrow's game. You and I know deeper down, there's always a chance to win the crown, but when we fail to give our best, we simply haven't met the test of giving all and saving none until the game is really won, of showing what is meant by grit, of fighting on when others quit, of playing through, not letting up, it's bearing down that wins the cup. Of dreaming there's a goal ahead, of hoping when our dreams are dead, of praying when our hopes have fled, yet losing, not afraid to fall if gamely we have given all, for who can ask more of a man than giving all within his span? Giving all, it seems to me, is not so far from victory. And so the fates are seldom wrong, no matter how they twist and wind, it's you and I who make our fates. We open up or close the gates on the road ahead or the road behind. And there's only one real gate that we want to be open to us. Thank you. Coach, uh, as we close our time together, I know that there's a special point to you as well about don't look back. Would you grace us? Well, I was asked some time ago to write a poem. I, I, I like to dabble in it. I'm not very good. I'm a rhymer, not a poet. <laughs> but as one of my granddaughters once said, uh, uh, and I was an older group, and they wanted me to write something. So I wrote something that said, when I, let's see. The years have left their imprint on my hands and on my face. Erect no longer is my walk and slower is my pace. But there is no fear within my heart because I'm growing old. I only wish I had more time to better serve my Lord. When I'm going to him in prayer, he has brought me inner peace. And soon my cares and worries and other problems cease. He's helped me in so many ways. He's never let me down. Why should I fear the future when soon I could be near his crown? Though I know down here my time is short, there's endless time up there, and he will forgive and keep me ever in his loving care. May I not waste a day that's left to glorify the name of the one who died that we might live and for our sins took all the blame. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on, one uh -huh. Coach, Coach, we are so honored to have you today. And for many of you that follow basketball know this, that every year before the Final Four, there's a breakfast that's held that's co-sponsored by Athletes in Action and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and it's called the Legends of the Hardwood Breakfast. This year, that breakfast, because the Final Four is held in Atlanta, uh, will be there. And every year at this breakfast, the Keys to Life Award is given to the Coach of the Year in college basketball in honor of John Wooden. Now this year, 
as a sign of our appreciation to you, Coach, Chick-fil-A is going to give the coach that's awarded the Keys to Life Award a $10,000 scholarship to go to their school because of our gratitude to you for gracing us with your presence today. That's Thank wonderful. You. That's very wonderful. That's good. Thank you. Have a seat for just a second. You want that on DVD, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are uh, so fortunate uh, that we've worked out an arrangement with Coach that we're going to be able to send that DVD to all of you. And so you're going to have your own copy of that. Uh, also, a quick reminder that if you've not picked up your book, Wooden on Leadership, which I hope you've picked that up, if you've not, have no fear, just email us and we'll be able to send you your copy if you didn't pick that up here. The Pyramid of Success is in that book. It's outlined and explained in detail as Coach did with us today. Also, you're going to receive, and yes, this is right here in my wallet, you're going to receive a copy of this card, a laminated card that has the timeless wisdom that Coach shared that came from his father. The two sets of threes and the seven rules to live by and uh, this is really special, and I think you'll enjoy keeping that with you. That was a great morning, wasn't it? Oh, what an honor. Well, I want to leave you guys with just one, one closing thought, uh, and that's this. When Mark started the week off, he challenged you with a question. And the question was, what questions will you ask this week? And I hope during the course of the week, you've asked a lot of questions. But as we end the time this morning, I want to actually leave you with a different question. And it's not about your questions, but it's about your commitments. As you think about this week, what commitments have you made this week? And I don't know what you've considered those commitments to be. But, for example, have you made a commitment this week to create a culture of encouragement in your restaurant? Do you want to send some more notes, a timely word, a touch? Do you want to create a culture of encouragement in your restaurant? Is that a commitment you've made? Maybe you made a commitment to start focusing a little bit more on strengths in yourself and with your team. As I think about that, the commitment could be, hey, am I going to be a gift finder or a gap finder in 2007? Am I going to look at people and immediately say, hey, you got a gap here? Or am I going to stop and say, hey, what's your gift? And how can I help you bring it out? And even with ourselves, am I going to be a gift finder or a gap finder in myself? Am I going to focus on strengths or weaknesses? Or maybe you made a commitment to invest more time in your people. Select or train or coach or develop at a higher level because you're investing that time. And maybe that's your commitment for 07. Or maybe your commitment's to strengthen your frontline leadership to achieve operational excellence. Or maybe it's to really change the recipe for service and seize and see, see and seize opportunities to go the second mile. 
or maybe elevate your marketing leadership and say, you know what, this is the time I'm really going to have more talent and more time on task to create emotional connections. Or maybe for the first time ever you committed to achieve symbol of success. Or maybe your commitment for 2007, more than anything else, is to say, you know what, success really is measured by my decision to give my personal best. Well, as you think about all the potential commitments you can make, my encouragement to you is this. Remember, your personal best is not a function of circumstances. It's not a function of conditions. And we heard from Coach, it's not a function of competition either. It is literally, our personal best is a function of our choice and our commitment to that choice. So as you approach 2007, I encourage you, make and keep commitments that matter. The power to create raving fans is in your people, and you unleash their power. Have an awesome 2007. Enjoy your break.